So hi, everyone. Again, my name is AJ Ehrenstein. I use he, him pronouns. I am Assistant Vice President of Lifelong Learning uh, here at the college. I've been here five years this week. Uh, it's my five year, super excited. Um, thank you for joining us here on a Friday afternoon to talk about the Laidlaw Research and Leadership Program. Before we get going, I'm going to hand it off to my two colleagues, Greg Triandis and Christine Valenza Shin, who are also on the call and will be answering questions alongside me today. Uh, to introduce themselves and give you a little bit of background on their work. So Christine, I'll hand it off to you first. I'm Christine Valenza Shin. I'm an alum of the college and I've been working here for a long time, um, but specifically in career development since 2012. Um, and as AJ mentioned, it's the uh, coming fifth year anniversary of the transformation from career development into Beyond Barnard. And it's been an amazing five years. And one of the most amazing re uh, recent developments is this laid law program. And I just met this morning with one of our um, uh, laid law scholars from the first cohort, just about her plans in general and it was just it was so it was great to see her name and remember her application and the interview process so couldn't be more excited to welcome all of you into the application process or interest and um oh and I'm the interim executive director of Beyond Barnard and I'll pass it over to Greg. Hi everybody uh, I'm Greg Triandis I'm the director of partnerships and employer relations here at the college I'm here seven years this past September I am, if you see my email, capital P apostrophe 24, my daughter is a junior here, my wife's an alum, and um, beyond Barnard, the partnerships, you might have even seen my name on some of the stipend programming, et cetera, and or employers trying to get a job, fairs, et cetera. So I'm looking forward to this info session and questions are uh, encouraged. Thanks to you both. Uh, so I'm gonna get going from here. And just a brief reminder, I mentioned this at the top of the session for those of you who arrived uh, a little bit earlier or right on time, um, the session's being recorded. We do welcome questions throughout. If you want to come off mute and ask a question, just keep in mind that your question will be uh, recorded as part of the recording. Uh, you can also put your questions in the chat. So one more time, I'm uh, AJ Ehrenstein. I'm Assistant Vice President for Lifelong Success here at the college. This is my second time around the track with the Laidlaw Research and Leadership Program application process. This is indeed the second year of the program here at the college. Laidlaw is present at 15 institutions in the United States and around the world. And as Christine already mentioned, we have 25 amazing individuals in the first cohort uh, from last year's application. One of the things I really want to emphasize today is that every single one of you should apply to this program. Uh, one of the, the most uh, meaningful parts of the application process that we saw last year was the opportunity that first and second year students had to establish new relationships with faculty that they had not already met. Uh, and just so I have a sense of who's in the Zoom today, if you are a first year, can you put a thumbs up for me in the emojis? I love these new animated uh, thumbs ups. It took Zoom three years to innovate this way, but there they are. And if you're a second year, give me a, maybe a little celebration sign. Uh, if you're a second year, I get some claps too. Thank you. Um, and just a reminder, can we make sure everybody is on mute? So they keep hiding her and individuals who are off mute. Great, so good sense of who is in the room. Um, so again, one of the things I wanna make sure that you leave today with is a sense that it's valuable to just apply to the program. We'll talk a little bit about your odds and how many people get the scholarship, but really we wanna make sure that everybody realizes this is an amazing process and a great opportunity to get to know faculty, staff, and other individuals at the college. There are two individuals who are part of the Laidlaw Committee who are not here today. They were at the initial information sessions, however, and we wanna make sure that uh, you know that the Athena Center for Leadership is an important part of the Laidlaw Committee. So they're represented by Umbreen Bhatti, who is the Constant Hess Williams 66 Director of the Athena Center, and Chris Need, who, who joined Athena last summer as the Director of Applied Learning. Beyond Barnard and Athena together, administer and oversee the entirety of the laid law program here at the college. As a quick refresher, 
about Laidlaw for those of you who were maybe just getting started in uh, thinking about Laidlaw for the summer. I know some of you may have attended information sessions in the fall, but some of you may be new to the program entirely as of today. So to make sure we're all on the same page, the Laidlaw Research and Leadership Program at Barnard Inc. now in its second year is a two-year commitment for those who are selected to participate. The program, which is present again at 15 different institutions around the world, provides two summers of funding and support for 25 scholars maximum at Barnard. The first summer entails six weeks of faculty mentored research during essentially May through the start of July. Selected scholars receive a stipend for their work and they are funded, uh, their housing at Barnard is also funded. The program is open to individuals across all disciplines with an emphasis on the humanities, social sciences, and the arts. Most students who are interested in conducting basic research in the sciences are a better fit for the Summer Research Institute, which is a whole nother kettle of fish. Some students, we do have some in the program from the first cohort who are from the science disciplines, but who are interested in thinking more specifically about how their research relates to leadership, bringing a project to market, a product to market, helping a community of people through science research, et cetera. So the first summer entails six weeks of faculty mentored research across disciplines. The second summer entails the creation of a leadership in action project, an opportunity for you to put your research into action and to develop your leadership skills in some typically NGO or nonprofit context. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. The scholarship is an opportunity to connect with the global network of laid law scholars. And indeed the foundation places an emphasis on connecting with individuals throughout the entire network. And throughout the two years, not just in the summer, scholars take part in required laid law activities, meetings, leadership development, training workshops, events, trips. So there are, there's a conference every year for North American institutions who participate in laid law and several of the scholars attend that. And then once per year, there is now uh, the return of a conference overseas at the, the home base in, in the UK. So that you know the, the timeline, so several of you, again, may have attended information sessions in December. The application is now open, and we'll share the link in the chat throughout the event today. Today is obviously the workshop that you're attending, the navigating the application process and finding a mentor workshop. It's our ambition to help kind of give you best practices, tips, tricks, uh, and insight into what we think make for really strong applications and best practices for reaching out to mentors. We'll do that today. And between now and February 9th, you have the opportunity to polish your application materials, reach out and connect with potential mentors. I want to be clear, and I'll say this several times just to make sure that everybody's aware, you don't need to have finalized a mentor relationship in order to apply. It's really important that you know that. We want you to start reaching out to faculty mentors, but we understand that some students may need an additional couple of weeks to really finalize who they'll be working with. So we do not require you to know who your faculty mentor will be when you, are, when you submit your application on February 10th at 5 p.m. Eastern time, not 11.59, uh, not February 11th, February 10th at 5 p.m. Eastern is when the application is due. We take a couple of weeks to review your application materials, and then we will select candidates for finalist interviews that will take place right before spring break from March 1st through March 9th. These will be relatively brief. We'll provide more information to those selected for the interview on what the format will be and what you can expect from those interviews. But for now, all you need to know is that they'll take place the first week of March. Um, they will likely be on Zoom, and they will be about 30 minutes each. We will do our best to get answers to all finalists by March 10th so that they have spring break to make a decision about how to spend their summer, whether they want to uh, spend that summer with us in the laid law cohort. Throughout April, there will be a range of onboarding events. We'll get you in the workday. We'll make sure you can get paid in the summer. You'll do what's called IRB training so that you're ready to conduct research with research subject, human research subjects, if that's something you're planning on doing, et cetera. And then around the middle of May, we will have our kickoff retreat. We'll connect you to cohort one. Um, we'll be one big happy family of 50 laid law scholars on campus 
uh, and you'll get going with your research shortly after that. The summer program is this year will be around May 15th through the start of July. Here's the agenda for the remainder of today's program. We're gonna start off by talking about how you structure a research question. For those of you who have taken a look at the application already, and if you haven't, I hope that you will do so uh, over the weekend. I will do as I promised and put a link in the chat now so that you can have it open if you want to alongside uh, the conversation. That should take you there. So we'll talk about structuring a research question and identifying a mentor. We'll talk a little bit about the leadership essays, which are also an element of the, uh, of the application. We'll emphasize doing the easy stuff and believe it or not, doing the easy stuff, making sure your resume is polished, actually checking in with Beyond Barnard to get some help on your application throughout the process. This is not something that everyone does. And it's very obvious when people don't do the easy stuff. So we really wanna emphasize that getting a little support, making sure your proofreading materials, getting your resume updated so that it looks the way that we expect it should look by working with advisors or peer career advisors here at Beyond Barnard, it's easy stuff. And we want you to just kind of like slam dunk on the easy stuff. I'll go through some frequently asked questions, but then we'll do discussion from there. So the first thing you're going to be asked on the application is to provide a sense of the research question that you are looking to ask. And you might ask yourself, you might ask us, what does research even look like in the humanities or social sciences? You know, many students come to us with questions like, I know what conducting research in the sciences look like. I know that that involves lab work, but I'm new to conducting original research in the humanities and social sciences. And I want to emphasize, you're not alone. That's most people uh, when they're at this stage of their training at Barnard. So what we want to talk about a little bit is how you actually build a research question, because this will take up most of your research essay. So the first thing to do is to read around, to ask questions, and to try to understand what other people are saying about a particular topic. So I'm going to use one of my favorite topics, the difference between uh, dog lovers and cat lovers. I am a dog lover. I don't know if, any, if anybody wants to put a thumbs up in the emoticons just so I can see like who's a dog lover, fine. If you're a cat lover, remain quiet. Uh, just kidding, your, your love of cats or dogs has no bearing on your application, obviously. So let's just say my interest is in dog lovers. And what I wanna do first of all, when thinking about articulating a research question is collecting information about dogs and dog lovers. I might do a Google search and look at news. I might use a resource available through the Columbia Library called EBSCO. I'll put that in the chat. EBSCO is an amazing research resource that will help you find journal articles, academic journal articles about a particular topic. I will try to figure out what the consensus is among researchers, news writers, popular media, et cetera, about dogs and dog lovers. You might think about this in an essay when you're writing what your research question is going to be. There might be a sentence that says, critical scholars about dog lovers share the view in general that X. So it's kind of like everybody thinks this about dogs. You might wanna say what's compelling about that consensus. So what seems consistently true about that view is all dog, dog lovers are really nice people. I think that's true. Okay, so you wanna to nod to the critical consensus. You're gonna look at what researchers out there in the world say about a particular theme or topic and say, this seems right about that consensus. Your intervention or contribution, the value of your research lies at first, in saying the word, but. And what you're trying to identify by opening up that space, that conceptual space through just the word, but, what's incomplete about that consensus? Okay, so let's say the critical consensus is that all dog lovers are nice people. But 
what scholars fail to recognize is that there's variability within dog lovers and their niceness based on the breeds that dog lovers find to be their favorite. Right? So essentially, I'm opening up a critical conversation by saying there's an incomplete assessment of this area of interest because scholars haven't looked at, well, let's say, lovers of uh, poodles versus uh, German shepherds. So notice now you've identified a place where you might ask a question about that. That question should answer essentially how will your research fill that gap or contribute new knowledge in a new way? So if the first sentence, the kind of like template starts out like people are saying X and what's compelling about that is Y, but they have ignored this important potential area of additional research. You would proceed from there by saying, in my project as a laid law scholar, I would aim to investigate variability in niceness among dog lovers by surveying individuals about their preferred breed. I will accomplish this investigation by what? Surveys, quantitative analysis, developing skills, collaborating with particular faculty. What are the steps that you will take to accomplish this? This is key for laid law applications. We wanna understand the feasibility of your project. What steps do you think you will need to take and how will you accomplish those steps? And the last part, also important, so what? Why is this research valuable? So just to continue with this kind of silly example of dog lovers and their variability based on breed, this research question adds valuable insight into whether niceness can be associated with variability of choice within a group and the broader scholarship associated with niceness. Give us a why this matters. Okay, so if your research, let's, let's use a not so silly example. Let's say your research focuses on educational outcomes for individuals from first generation college backgrounds uh, in institutions of higher learning. And what you're trying to assess is what kinds of interventions relate to higher completion rates for college. Why is this important? This research is valuable because it may inform policymakers and college leaders about the kinds of resources that help advance graduation outcomes for individuals from first generation low income backgrounds. Give us some sort of reason why this research question is important. So just to recap, What's the critical consensus? What's everybody talking about? Why is that critical consensus maybe compelling in some way? Then what do people miss or where's there a gap that you can contribute to? How will your research fill that gap or contribute new knowledge? How will you accomplish that project? And why is the project important? If you follow those steps and try to think about how to, not necessarily to kind of like, you know, I'm not saying like you must say in journal articles X and then what is compelling what don't you know don't have to follow it like mad libs but if you follow this relative shape of a research question you will be in good stead not only to articulate your research for laid law but for other opportunities as well Now finding a research question is easier when you ask for help so one piece of advice, if you're saying, oh gosh, I, have, I don't even know anything that I should ask about. I'm just interested in political science and you know, American democracy maybe. Well, it's easier to figure out what people are talking about and where to look for the critical consensus if you start by asking questions. So we suggested beyond Barnard all the time that one of the best ways to establish outreach to a faculty member at Barnard at Columbia and by the way, laid law scholars, and I'll say this several times, can work with Barnard or Columbia faculty. By researching the faculty bio pages of a range of faculty members in whatever department is interesting to you, 
you will find the research interests of those faculty and they'll get pretty specific. Sending an initial cold email to that faculty member saying, hey, I'm interested, I saw Professor X that you're interested in dog and cat love, cat lovers. Um, <laughs> uh, it would be great to come to your office hours and talk about my interests in uh, finding a research project for laid law around dogs. Right, and just going to office hours and talking about your shared interests in a topic that they are conducting research in. So that's the first thing. Part of finding a mentor is simply identifying faculty with shared potential interests and sending an email and saying, can I come to your office hours to talk about your work? In that conversation, you can start talking about laid law and your need to complete an application and hoping to work with that mentor. We say this with SRI students. I say this with laid law scholars every year. Faculty are excited to meet with Barnard students at Columbia, at Barnard, and really elsewhere as well. They are even more excited when you tell them that you're interested in the laid law in the laid law scholars program, which has a reputation on campus, and you're interested in working with them as a potential mentor. Because hey, you're going to help them advance their research while also creating a, a project under their guidance. So in this, the process, the application process for laid law is meant to give you an occasion for connecting with faculty mentors, give you an opportunity, an excuse to talk to a faculty member that maybe you've been thinking about going to office hours for, but haven't found a good reason. So take advantage of the process itself for creating that connection. Now, look, when you submit your application, you are not writing it in blood. Right? We are not going to hold you to your research question. Your research question is supposed to evolve. We want you in the process of research to find new questions that you didn't anticipate. Research, when done best, evolves, generates new questions, and helps you think about problems in a new way. What the application is actually asking for is evidence that you understand what a project could look like. It's less what you will definitely do and you are being held to it, you know, in absolute foreverness. It's instead, oh, I've done the work as an applicant to understand what undergraduate research in the laid law program looks like. I care about laid law. I have put my application together in such a way that demonstrates I've given this some thought in a structured manner. That's what we are looking to see. And just to note, this is not a, a feature just of laid law. If you're applying to graduate school down the line, if you're applying to other fellowships down the line, grants and applications always follow this general rule that research evolves and candidates change and research will change you. It's part of the exciting thing about the program. So I've already scooped some of this crash course on finding a mentor, um, but faculty bios are really a great resource to mine for information. Um, they are pretty standard at Barnard, since Barnard is a little bit smaller of an institution. Uh, there's a little bit more standardization among departments about what uh, faculty include on their bios and what they, what they typically look like. Um, so you should be able to, to go to a particular department. I'm going to pull up, for example, um, you guys, I'm just thinking about dogs a lot. My son is like suddenly really into dogs. He's 18 months old and I know I have to get a dog. So, I mean, I'm just thinking about dogs. So Alex Horowitz, uh, in English and psychology studies dog cognition. Uh, she actually studies dogs at Barnard. She's super cool. If you haven't seen her before, you should read some of her, um, you know, Times op-eds and then maybe your research if it's interesting to you about dog personalities. Um, but her bio uh, basically presents all of the different publications that she's uh, come up with recently, her books, you can find out information about her there. You can read some of her news articles. You get a good sense of what she focuses on. Um, using these bio pages is a great way, and I'll just link this in the chat as an example. Uh, using these bio pages is a great way to get a pretty clear sense of what particular research interests are. Um, oh, Christine, you already did that. Thank you. Um, let me go back to, and by the way, I, I found this again, just by Googling, um, just by uh, 
Googling Alex Horowitz uh, and Anne Barnard, and the first result that came up is her bio page. Keep in mind that when you are looking for a mentor, it is likely that your mentor will not do exactly the thing you do, right? What you're trying to find is somebody who's like, think about it as a dartboard, right? There's somebody who's relatively close to the bullseye of what you're interested in. You may be interested in carceral justice. Um, you may be in, uh, for minors, and you might find someone who's working on reform of the prison system but doesn't work with kids. Totally fine to reach out to that mentor. You don't have to find someone who is exactly mapped onto what you are thinking you're interested in. Close enough is good enough, and it's worth sending out an email. We totally understand that this may be your first time reaching out to faculty for these purposes. And again, the label application is designed by Barnard to foment those opportunities to create that, that those conversations. Keep in mind though, no matter whether it's your first time or your 10th time reaching out to faculty, it is absolutely not their first time being reached out to. So there's always a certain amount of anxiety about reaching out to a professor, but believe me, Barnard faculty, and part of the reason I hope you all came to Barnard is their accessibility, their approachability, uh, and their desire to mentor uh, undergraduate students. And I think that really does extend to many of our friends and colleagues across the street at Columbia. Um, they will have been approached 10 times this week uh, to ask for research support. So please don't think this is a, you know, oh my gosh, I'm asking them for something major. Uh, no, this is an opportunity for them to work with a student who shares their commitment to a particular body of knowledge. I would say, by the way, don't send your CV and your resume right away. You don't need to send a thousand words about all of the things that you've accomplished at Barnard in your, you know, uh, one semester or three semesters here so far. Um, what you instead have to do is map onto their, uh, their research interests and talk about your enthusiasm to talk about those shared interests. Okay, so we talked about the research question and a little bit about finding a mentor. Let's dig into the leadership essays as well. We get a lot of questions about these. When it comes to your second summer essay, we ask you to think about different places where you might conduct a leadership in action project. Now, summer 2024, if summer 2023 seems far away right now, then summer 2024 may seem like light years, galaxies away. And that's true for us too. Again, we are not looking for you to know exactly what you're going to be doing with a leadership and action project in your second summer at this point. What we want to know is that you've given some thought to how your research could relate to a real problem in the world that an NGO, a nonprofit, a startup, some sort of entity is dealing with on a daily basis. We want you to do some research if you're interested in reproductive rights, for example. Sure, Planned Parenthood is part of that, but maybe there's a small um, organization in Texas working with migrants who are coming to the United States and who are also pregnant people, right? Maybe you want to work with that organization. We want to see that you've done some research on potential places where you could take the research you're doing in summer one and bring it out into the world to help a community in summer two. Again, we know that your plans will change. We want you to be responsive to what the questions are asking. And this is kind of like basic best practices, not only for applications like these, but also for essays in classes. Oftentimes, I, I remember in college, like I would try to answer questions that weren't being even asked by the essay prompt. I want you to be really, really careful about just understanding exactly what we're asking for in each of these questions on the application and answer those questions, those questions alone. I also want to suggest that descriptions of leadership in action projects are readily available on the leadership in action section of the laid law website. These are not secrets. Uh, they're specific bullets that they put up there about what they expect leadership in action projects to look like. And you should just take a look. Tell us how your leadership in action project may put you outside of your comfort zone, might encourage you to travel abroad, might encourage you to provide support to a community in need. That again shows us not exactly where you're going to be next summer when you're working in a leadership action project, but instead that you've done your homework, that you understand what this program is about and how you might conceivably be a part of the community that uh, constitutes laid law at Barnard. The third essay asks you um, to, and I, I just saw a, uh, I'm seeing a couple of questions in the chat here um, that I want to have fidelity to. 
Uh, so I want to answer the, the question about methodology. It's a great question, Marina, um, a little bit later. And uh, just Serena, just because we're on the topic of leadership in action projects right now. Uh, yes, you can absolutely suggest multiple potential options for summer two in your essay. Now, we don't want you to like list 100 and make the essay mostly just all of these different reasonable examples. But if you have two or three, then you can say, uh, what I would recommend is I've chosen organization A, B, and C. They approach this problem from different perspectives. But what draws them together for me, what makes all three of them potentially attractive is what? Right. So it's not necessarily these are three totally different. I'm going to work at NASA. I'm going to work at a manatee organization. I'm going to work at like, you know, uh, Planned Parenthood. Uh, well, maybe they maybe they all have something in common, but we don't want to see like three totally disparate things. We want to th well, we want you to be thinking about how, if you're looking at different organizations, they're in the same neighborhood of your potential interests as your potential interests. I want to talk about the the your style of leadership essay. Um, I think where candidates have gotten themselves into trouble in the past is using sweeping language. Uh, like leadership to me is a ship and that ship is made of, you know, uh, these kinds of like very broad metaphorical conceptual kinds of essays typically fell flat with the committee last year. And we gave the same advice last year. So, um, you know, I, I really would encourage you to, to, to follow this advice if you can. Um, the number one adage to use when crafting a leadership essay is a creative writer's old saw that essentially says, show, don't tell. And that essentially means we want to see you as a leader in action. When you're talking about leadership, I don't mean you have to talk about being student government representative in your high school. You don't have to be on MACAC at Barnard now. Leadership for you might mean that you have three siblings and two parents who worked long hours. And leadership for you was making sure that your siblings got home from school on time and were and had a meal when they got home. Leadership can mean a lot of things, but what is most effective in these essays is that you show us yourself in the context of being a leader as you define a leader, okay? This can be a creative essay, but it should still be an argumentative essay. What do we mean by that? I mean that it should have a thesis, right? It should be like, to me, a leader does these kinds of things and then shows us you doing those things in a leadership role. I talk about using fewer adjectives and adverbs here, more nouns and verbs, right? We're gonna learn more about you as a leader when you describe yourself in action in some scene. And I wanna make sure that I'm really driving the point home here. We're just interested in seeing how you think about leadership. We need all kinds of leadership to create a diverse, and rich cohort among the scholars. And so we need leaders who uh, you know, have been uh, excelled in student government. We need leaders who, uh, whose main style of leadership was that you had to manage a small team in a restaurant job when you were in high school. We need people thinking about leadership as service and as volunteering. We need leaders thinking about project management in the context of the classroom. Everyone can write a strong leadership essay. Um, it's about thinking about your where context that you have been in through the lens of leadership. All right, let's talk about doing the doing the easy stuff. Um, so the first thing that I really want to emphasize, um, and by the way, we will have uh, open office hours. I, I should have highlighted this in the uh, application timeline, but Beyond Barnard will have open office hours about the laid law application. Um, on February 3rd, you'll be meeting with different uh, laid law committee members at Beyond Barnard, and we'll be here to answer questions that you might have about your in-progress application. But in addition, you can schedule time with peer career advisors to make sure that your resume is polished one page and looks professional for the laid law application. We want you to tailor your materials to the laid law process, which means we wanna see a leadership section, okay? We wanna see how you're gonna describe leadership on your resume. Um, peer career advisors can do wonders 
uh, with applications for laid law and for internships and for first jobs. So I really want to encourage you to sign up for time in Handshake. When you log into Handshake, click Career Center and then Appointments. And there's availability with peer career advisors usually tomorrow uh, or we're on Friday, there's availability on Monday. You're gonna need a transcript and that's really easy to do until you're trying to figure out how to do it five minutes before the deadline and you still haven't done it. Uh, getting a transcript at Barnard is increasingly easy. They've made the process uh, really, really straightforward. Um, so I would say it's a nice way to get your, it's a nice, it's a nice small way to ensure that you are moving forward and checking off a box. Um, by the way, I'm just going to put it into the chat, the link where you can request a transcript. Um, when it comes to, by the way, uh, we focus in detail about one leadership experience. Um, when it comes to in the leadership essays, and I think on the resume too, um, think about that your application materials as supporting one another. So Marina asks a question, do you recommend that we focus in on one leadership experience or various experiences? Um, I think that they can be, a, a strong essay can be written in either style with either focus, as long as there's sufficient detail. It's not necessary for you to list all of your impressive leadership experiences in the leadership essay because we have your resume too. Right? So think about the application materials together. Your resume will be an, uh, an opportunity to add additional context uh, in bullet point form about what you did in a particular leadership experience. So don't think that you have to say everything in the essay. Um, you, you may wanna talk about more than one leadership experience, sure. But again, that essay is not oriented towards tell us about all of your leadership experiences. Um, it should instead be uh, it should instead be telling us something specific about um, how you're defining leadership. Um, Nori, I see your question. I'm going to keep moving, and I'm going to ask if um, uh, Christine can take a look at that, and we'll get to it uh, in a second. Uh, this. No, no, no. So you that's a, that, so I should be clear, by the way. So seven dollars is if you want an official transcript being sent. You only need an unofficial transcript. You can get that through the portal at any time. So I'm going to paste in the correct um, part of the prompt here. Current students can view and print their unofficial transcripts anytime at no cost through the My Barnard portal. So you should be able to use that. Next, make sure that you are completing your essay in time to proofread, right? We wanna make sure that you are, uh, that you have adequate time to have attention to detail. A great opportunity to work on your essays, to have someone work with you both on content uh, and uh, you know, some kind of close reading that they don't copy edit generally is to get your uh, leadership and get your essays submitted to a writing fellow and work with them. They require complete drafts to be submitted in advance of a meeting, but writing fellows like peer career advisors are tremendously effective resources for students when putting together these kinds of materials. Next, I wanna suggest that because the application process is about more than just laid law, that because you'll be connecting with faculty members, um, it's a great idea to send a thank you note to anyone who's writing a letter for you or anyone who is supporting your application process. Because the relationship with that faculty mem member may continue regardless of whether you are accepted into the laid law cohort. You may want, need, uh, be excited to uh, have a relationship with that faculty member regardless of your participation in laid law. So send a thank you note uh, to any faculty who are supportive of your application throughout the process. I'll stop here just for a moment to address another um, uh, to address another question that comes that came through. So, how important is GPA to the program? We look at applicants holistically. Okay, I think on balance, GPA is less important than a really strong research proposal. Um, Laid law does value scholarship and strong academic performance, but from the perspective of the committee, it's much more important to see a strong set of uh, 
ideas about research and leadership in the materials. So there was GPAs all over the place in the in the first cohort uh, of the Laid Law Scholars last year. And I want to say too that it's our experience at Beyond Barnard, it's experience that we've had with the Summer Research Institute. And it's also just true across disciplines that research tends to make you a better student, tends to make you a student who performs better uh, in the long run. So we want the Laid Law program not just to accept people who've got you know, four O's and above, uh, but to accept people and, and have the program actually help them perform better and better in classes. Got a question about writing fellows being available uh, first in, on February 7th. If you can get in uh, before the application deadline, I would suggest certainly talking to them. Uh, in addition, like I said, you'll have the opportunity to workshop your essays with Beyond Barnard staff as well. Um, I want to answer another question that came through. Actually, let's let's power through to um, the FAQs, and then I'll start answering more questions that are coming privately to me um, in the chat. So, first question is: I I can't uh, I can't find a mentor. Uh, what do I do? Um, the first thing is you can talk with us about ideas. Uh, the second is we'll be circulating a schedule a, a list of faculty. Who are who have expressed interest in hosting laid law scholars and who have written project descriptions that you might be affiliated with? Um, I think it's great to talk to your pre-major advisor uh, if you have a pre-major advisor still to reach out to chairs of academic departments. There are lots of different ways to surface potential ideas for mentors. We talked already, can your mentor be a faculty member at Columbia? Absolutely. We had individuals at the law school, the design school, at academic departments across Columbia, in addition to Barnard. Does your mentor have to be a full-time faculty member? Yes. So they have to be a lecturer, an assistant professor, an associate professor, a full professor. Your, your mentor cannot be an adjunct faculty member at the college. However, uh, I saw a question that came directly to me um, about whether you should look at tenured or non-tenured faculty members. There's really no import there. What we want is letters of recommendation and mentorship to be from faculty who know you and who are excited about your project. So the, the need for faculty to be uh, full-time faculty and not adjunct is the only cutoff. But other than that, we don't look at rank uh, when it comes to feasibility of a project or promise of a laid law research project in any way. So you should pick a faculty mentor who you are excited to work with and who uh, is, a, is a vociferous supporter of your project. Um, how many scholars will there be? We are, as I mentioned very briefly, we are capped at 25. So there'll be 25 total scholars in cohort two as there are in cohort one. What are your chances? Um, I would say it doesn't really matter. Um, I mean, in one sense, we don't know. We won't know what the percentage, the acceptance rate is until people actually apply. Uh, but the other is we really hope that you're not thinking too strongly about whether to apply based on how likely it is that you will get a scholarship. One of the things I hope I've made a, a, a good job of doing today is to advocate for the value of the application process, regardless of whether you're selected. So the Laid Law Scholarship gives you an awesome opportunity to ask for letters, uh, to establish mentoring relationships that will proceed regardless of your selection as a scholar. Are the workshops and leadership trainings mandatory? Yes, we hope that all scholars will make every effort to attend as many of the events and required trainings as possible. Are there exceptions? Of course, we've had family emergencies, health emergencies, um, et cetera. And we're totally understanding about those. But everybody should know that this is not just a summer program. It's not just a requirement. Uh, it's not just six weeks out of the year for two years. There really are some pretty substantial time commitments around the year. Um, we're meeting with the uh, cohort one next, uh, I believe it's next Friday, um, for example. And we want you to think about the fact that you're, one of the values, one of the big values of the Laid Law program is the connections that you make with the community of scholars here at Barnard and outside of Barnard. And we're pretty adamant that you're supposed to be connecting with individuals from around the Laid Law network too. Um, do I need to be in person for New York for in New York for all of the first summer? We do require that students be present in New York 
during the first summer of research. And that's because the community aspect and the completion of events and resources on campus here at Barnard and in New York City, it's a really important part of the experience. So we do ask that students be here for the first summer. Now, are there exceptions? Do people spend a week uh, visiting family? Sure. Do you, can you zoom in for one session? Sure. If you have COVID and you know, you're on the mend, but you need to attend virtually, sure, of course. But we really do ask that students be available as laid law scholars to be in person for as much of the first summer as possible. And of course, what if your leadership in action idea changes? Great. We think that's great news. Again, what we really want to emphasize is the importance of having some feasible ideas in the first when you apply. I'm going to take off some of the questions that have come through in the chat, um, and then I will get back to hopefully opening up dialogue for the remainder of our time here. Um, so first, uh, are international students also eligible for the program? Yes, many of the first cohort are international students. Can you have a mentor at Teacher College? Yes, I believe we actually do have one or two who are at Teachers College. Teachers College is a Columbia school. So Columbia and Barnard mentors are totally fair game. You just can't have a mentor outside of the Columbia and Barnard ecosystem. And again, your mentor needs to be a full-time faculty member. If you have questions about a faculty member's uh, adjunct or full-time, or if they're even staff or faculty, you can certainly ask us those questions. Really want to direct everybody to laidlaw at barnard.edu for a great, uh, you know, that's a, the number one way to get questions on the committee's radars. Um, I see a question, how should we be explaining to professors we ask for a letter, um, what they should have in the letter? Uh, I think that's a great question. I think the best thing to do when uh, submitting uh, a request for a letter of recommendation from a faculty member is to send them what the laid law program is overall. Have a conversation with them that stipulates that they're to, um, they are to, uh, uh, sorry, I lost train of thought and seeing more questions come in. They are supposed to be able to account for your capacity to conduct research and your promise as someone who will deliver the value of that research in a context that is outside the classroom. Uh, or the archive, right? So you, they should be speaking to your ability to do research as a student and to bring that research into the world. I'm um, talking about both your capacity to uh, be a scholar and a leader. I'm going to invite my colleagues uh, back into the conversation as well to make sure that you know they know they can add um, their perspectives as well. I have a question: Can the mentor and reference writer uh, be the same person? Absolutely, 100%. Um, and that's a great way to show that the mentor is committed to the project. If you want to ask your mentor to write for you, um, then that's perfectly acceptable. Um, how will you hear about faculty members who are looking out for students to help them in their research? We will send to anyone who has filled out the Laidlaw interest form. And I believe that should be everyone here today at this point. But I will relink the interest form in case it's helpful to you. Um, Christine, what am I missing? Greg, what am I missing in the meantime? I just want to call out a couple of things I added to the comments along the way. Just a reminder that PCAs, like everyone else, uh, some of their schedules are still in flux. So their official full hours don't begin until Monday um, the 30th. They are in between definitely offering some hours. So just don't, uh, it may be the case for the next week or so that when you go to look for an appointment, there won't be something available tomorrow or you know the next day. So just keep circling back. That'll, that'll start getting filled out over the next couple of weeks. Um, I put the exact dates that we expect you to be in New York, which is the um, first six weeks of um, the summer, May 22nd through June 30th. Um, and I just want to, this became an issue last year, the mentor and the recommender can be the same person, but they absolutely do not have to be the same person. Um, okay. And in some cases, the mentor may be a faculty member that's relatively new to you and doesn't know you as a student and can't, you know, may not be able to write, you know, write effectively for you. So they can definitely be, and in some cases are going to need to be two different faculty members, not the, not the same. One thing I did think of is if you are reaching out to the professor for the first time and you know you're not exactly sure, you know, the articulation is the important part of this. So you want to make sure you even say this in a couple of letters, a context action the result. Why are you reaching out with the context of laid law? This is why I'm reaching out. It's not dry toe specifics, 
but so they have a complete understanding of where you're coming from. And if they needed more information, they'll ask you or at least find the resources. So right to the point as much as you possibly can in an articulation is the best way for that then professor to then carry on. Is it Mila? I think I see your hand up. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, um, I just wanted to ask, um, I know a lot of the things we've been talking about is more of like logistics for the application, but I wanted to ask more of like the experience of the students. So like, what is one thing that, especially in the first cohort, did you notice in regards to like some of the barriers or some of the insecurities that they had in regards to their research question? I think that uh, it's a great question. I appreciate it. I think, and maybe it's useful to everyone to just know the commonalities here, right? Like this is many people's first rodeo when it comes to um, conducting research. And the, um, the kind of prevailing sentiment for many students is trepidation about articulating a research question, structuring it, um, finding individuals to, to you know, commit to surveys. Um, and I think that one of the best things about the Laidlaw cohort is we do meet weekly throughout the summer and basically have honest opportunities to share out what's going on, right? And there's a real sense of commonality. Um, and I think that there is, a, a, now that we're in the second application cycle, I can say this with some confidence, like you don't know yet, uh, but the faculty are really supportive in helping to work through some of the, the things that you think will be key problems or key challenges to conducting your research. Like they are incredibly supportive uh, throughout the summer. You know, many of them came to the colloquium at the end with the, the posters, which I don't know if y'all have seen them, but the posters are actually still up outside the mailroom. So you get a sense for the diversity of projects. Um, I think that, you know, I just want to answer use this as an opportunity to answer the question about methodology. I think students often have trepidation about like, I don't know, I know what my question is, but I don't know how to get it done. Um, and so often faculty mentors are essential in helping to train you on methodological skills that are particular to a, a discipline. So I guess what I would say, Mila, in, in, in kind of general is the most common area of anxiety that I saw among students is that they just didn't know how to do research yet. Um, and the fact of the matter is the program is, is structured in such a way that that is the primary learning of the first summer. And like, if you have that anxiety, that's great. It means, you know, that research is hard. Um, we're not asking you to know how to do research during the application. We're asking you to know how to articulate what research might be. And then the program itself is tremendous at helping students prepare. Uh, you know, if I was pitching the program, I would say it's a great opportunity in the first summer to think about how you're gonna structure research as an undergraduate in your junior and senior years. Um, and for individuals who apply as first years as, as sophomores. I hope that answered your question a little bit. Yes, I did, thank you. Um, Nori, you have a question about birthright coming back. So coming back to 24th, May 24th, um, it, it may be challenging because the retreat, the, the planning retreat, Christine, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the retreat is the week before. Uh, last year, the retreat was May 14th and 15th, and I imagine that will be for the, the six weeks. Um, you know, I would never tell an applicant don't apply because you think you're going to be a week late on campus or you're not going to be able to be here for a particular day. Like, go ahead and apply. We can always work on logistics and timing when we get to it. Um, but I think it is important to really emphasize, this comes up more with students who are going to be a, taking an internship that is like half of June, can you apply to laid law? Uh, we really we really would say probably not. You'd want to think about pushing your internships to later in the summer. Part of the reason why it's six weeks and most of that is in June is so that if you want to pursue another internship with another external host, if you want to go home, if you want to do something else, you still have half your summer, um, even though you're you're done with uh, with laid law. I had a question about can it can you ask a TA for a letter? Um, I think stronger letters, strongest letters always come from people who know you best. We ask for a faculty letter though, um, because we do want you to do some work around getting to know a faculty member. Um, so would we accept a letter from a TA? Sure, but I will tell you that when it comes to what we're looking for in a letter of recommendation, we're hoping it's a professor from, if you're first year, uh, from your, your first semester or your mentor. Christine, am I characterizing that correctly? Yeah, that sounds right. If you, um, um, yeah, I, I, we could, you could chat with us 
uh, maybe during the drop-ins if you're if you're really having trouble identifying a, a you know faculty member as opposed to a TA. But uh, yeah, try for try for a faculty member first, and then take it from there. Alina, go ahead. I I just wanted to ask if our second essay can have things that we're already like participated in. Or does it need to be something that we're like looking forward to endeavor in? Like can yeah. it include some of our current um, sure, like, yeah. Things? If you are if you are already associated with an organization where you might want to do your leadership in action project, that's totally fine. Now keep in mind the leadership in action project is supposed to push you outside of your comfort zone. That's one of the requirements on that the foundation emphasizes. So it shouldn't be, I'm gonna go back to do the same thing that I've already been doing at this place. It should be, how are you going to push yourself to something new? How will the foundation's scholarship and support help you push your work in a new direction, potentially in those, those familiar contexts? Does that make sense? Right, thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, I saw a question that I did not get to. If someone we want to ask as a mentor has already mentored someone for the last cohort, are they still eligible? Absolutely. Um, we love lay, we love laid law mentors who know the program. In fact, some of our best mentors in the first cohort had mentored Columbia students in their program, and we're just excited that Barnard was now part of this community as well. So they knew the program, they hopped right in, they knew about it. In terms of time commitment, you can always, if faculty mentors have questions, there is a faculty FAQ that we are able to send. So if they have concerns about um, their the amount of time that they are supposed to dedicate, uh, or the compensation that they are provided. And we do have numbers that we can provide to faculty that are compensated for their time as mentors, um, which is important. And we are always clear um, about that with faculty. Um, they, you can certainly direct them to address their questions to laidlaw at barnard.edu, and we can share that information with them. Did I not get to anyone's question or are there other burning issues that you were hoping to get to? I just wanted to see if we could circle back to the question about methodology. So we don't have to be like 100% sure on it, but we should have sort of like a general idea of what we're trying to strive for. Yeah, so I, I think I, I would want to make sure that everybody on this call knows we're not asking you to be like, I'm going to use Hope's third theorem approach to okay. quantitative assessment in order to accomplish this. It's more like, okay, here's what I would have to do. I'm going to structure a survey under the guidance of this mentor. I hope to deploy that survey to this population of people and then assess the results in order to report out this thing, right? The level of specificity on methodology does not need to be like, I know exactly some hyper-specific uh, protocol uh, that's live in the discipline right now. Instead, it has to be like, I would need this and then this and then this. Um, so I, you know, I think it's great to, to, if you're interested in, if you know enough about like what you want to do that you know there's a methodological approach to the problem that some professor does and like their role as a mentor would be to train you on that methodological approach to research. Great, like ask them to be a mentor, ask them to be not your mentor maybe, but like an advisor on the project and they can provide context. Um, but you don't have to get to that level of granularity in the application, it's not expected. Joyce, we're gonna update the, um, the website with all of last year's uh, basically the lists of the mentors and the uh, the posters, but you can indeed uh, just go check them out. The posters are still up outside the mailroom in the hallway. So go find your care package from your latest, your latest care package uh, in the mailroom and take a look at the laid law projects that are up there. They're awesome. Seeing that we were on, uh, seeing that we are, uh, past one, I want to address two questions. First, first, I wanted to clarify if students accepted would be receiving a stipend in order to do research. Yes, students receive a stipend for their research in the first summer. They also receive a stipend in their second summer. Students in their first summer, because everybody's expected to be at Barnard, have their housing covered for the period during which you are required to be at Barnard as well. I want to make sure that's an important thing to make sure everybody walks away knowing. Um, Besides the Beyond Barnard office hours, are there any other mixers or open house type events by Beyond Barnard or Diana Center? For Laidlaw, no. 
Um, we do have all sorts of events throughout the semester, so we hope you'll come and see us uh, just in general uh, here in Elliott Hall. Um, but we do want to make an effort to, we will make an effort to communicate to you all the ability to come by the office and work on your application on February 3rd. We are over time. I'm so appreciative for questions. Thank you for your engagement. Thanks to Christine and Greg for being here and providing perspectives. Please apply. We really are excited to hear your projects. You all do a great job on these things. Good luck connecting with faculty. Don't be strangers. Please just has, don't hesitate. Um, reach out with your questions and we will be here to support you. Have a great weekend, everybody. Good luck with the second week of class and finalizing those schedules. Thank you.